tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Today's episode of Horror Hill is brought to you by Upstart, a lending platform that believes you are more than your credit score, where your education and experience helps you get the loan you deserve. And by Shudder, the premium streaming video service from AMC Networks, with the largest, fastest growing selection of horror, thriller, and supernatural content in the world. I'll tell you a bit more about Upstart and Shudder later on tonight. Until then, double check your doors and windows and settle in. Darkness is at your door, and it can't wait to join you. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself, if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness <laughs> has found you. <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Horror Hill. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 7. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. In today's episode, courtesy of authors Jeff Sturdivant, Krista Carmen, and Dee Dee Howard, come three bone-chilling tales about harrowing hoarders, horrific housekeepers, and malleable memories. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. <laughs> Our first tale of terror this evening comes to us courtesy of author Jeff Sturdevant. In it, we'll meet a duo that's made it their duty to clean up other people's messes, usually after they're dead. When they're called to sanitize the home of deceased hoarder Helen Waltman, however, they discover that even death isn't enough to make some people let go. Without further ado, I present to you, The Buzzards. Need a crime scene cleanup? How about a crime scene cleanup in a hoarder's house? Well, free market problems get free market solutions. It only makes sense I ended up with Caesar. 
I guess you could call me the President and Caesar the VP, but those are pretty prestigious titles considering the nature of our business. We're no executives. We aren't too proud to get our hands dirty either. I was strictly crime scene cleanup before Caesar and I joined forces. With violent deaths at a relative low, my job was easier than ever. Seldom were the days picking brains out of stucco ceilings, bleaching bloody grout, and peeling human skin off the undersides of subway trains. Natural deaths were common enough, but dragging grandma's deathbed to the dump was hardly a day's work. Caesar was a sanitation technician, though he'd also answer to garbage man, shit shoveler, and, of course, hey Chico, you can't dump that here. Stuffing dirty old clothes into a contractor bag while I sponged biohazardous who knew what from the floor of some geriatric death fest, we mused at how often we ran into each other. Why not combine forces? We were like two peas in a pod, after all. But since the peas were a little too cute of a name, we decided to call ourselves the buzzards. Dead bodies, toxic waste, or just your old couch. If you need it gone... Caesar and I will swarm in and make it happen. The buzzards take on all carrion. No job too big or too small. Well, in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have said no job too big. Not that I don't appreciate our special little spot in the police chief's Rolodex, but those scumbags have to be belly laughing back at the precinct. Sure, we are the men for the job, but they sent us into hell. And they sure as hell know it. Some hoarders keep dozens of cats. Some hoarders keep decades of newspapers. Some hoarders keep spackle buckets of their own bodily waste. Helen Waltman. She kept everything. It was an old cape house on the outskirts of Orange Oaks, spaced out from the neighbors, like the houses themselves knew to stay away from this one. The smell hit us at a hundred yards with the windows closed, a vile kind of rot, fused with a repellent tang of death. The place was standing there like a filthy white tombstone wound with crime scene tape. No actual crime, per se, had been committed, but there had been a death. The back door had been inaccessible for years, it turned out. Once the horde became so prolific that it collapsed over the front door, there simply was no way out for an old lady. Helen Waltman had entombed herself. I backed the dump truck as close to the house as I could. We got out and suited up, trying to hold our breath until we got the masks on. If I had known it was going to be this bad, I'd have been fully geared up before we reached the county line. Standing on the front stoop, I could hear the living biomass beyond the door. Caesar and I stopped and looked at each other. It was clear we were in for a tough one. There's a stinker in there, bro, Caesar said. I nodded. When a guy like me was this near to tossing his cookies, it certainly was a ripe petunia. You hear that? Hear what? Caesar asked. Fucking cockroaches. There's always fucking cockroaches, bro. But he knew what I was getting at. There were different levels of bug problems. This one, you could diagnose before you opened the door. It was terminal. Caesar gave me a friendly shot in the arm. Bro, where I come from, the roaches got wings. Yeah, well, I'm from New Jersey. The door opened with an almost pressurized release of stench. On instinct, we stood aside as if to let it dissipate. A useless gesture. I looked at him and he looked at me, silently daring each other to go in first. You going first, bro? Of course I was. I always went first. I guess it's on account of me being the president and all. I readjusted my breather and peeked inside. It looked like the entrance to a cave. Two shovels left on the floor, presumably the ones the cops used to dig out Helen Waltman. I stepped over the threshold, turning sideways to skirt the stacks of composting garbage. Past the sphincter of an entranceway, I spotted a chain hanging from the ceiling and pulled it. A yellowed old light illuminated the horde. Roaches cascaded down the walls, disappearing into the mountains of filth. At my feet lay what remained of the woman. The lucky cops, rookies no doubt, had been kind enough to remove the body. 
but the silhouette of melted flesh stained the floorboards like a grisly chalk line. I'm no forensics expert, but it's pretty clear she'd been there for quite a while before the cops showed up. It's also clear she was lacking in the friends and family department. I looked around. Household artifacts pocked with mold, strung with clotheslines wall to wall, hung with black and nameless dross. Shadows swaying with the loosely hanging light bulb, crawling with bugs, composting in its own heat. I've said this before, and maybe I've meant it every time, but I've never before said it so sincerely. This is the worst one I've ever seen. Caesar was turning in circles, overwhelming himself before the work even got underway. How does this even happen, bro? You'd think the bitch changed her ways at some point, wouldn't you? I shook my head. People don't change. You spend your life trying to fight who you are, but... In the end... Yeah, I guess no one knows better than you, he said. He's right. Clean up enough pointless suicides and you start wondering what took them so long. No one jumps off a building the first time it crosses their mind. No one swallows a bottle of barbiturates in the CVS drive thru No one pulls a ten-pound trigger on a whim. Most people are designed to preserve their lives at all costs. Others seem programmed to self-destruct. It's only a matter of how long they can fight it off. Eighteen years? Twenty-five years? Sixty-five years in the case of Helen... If I had to guess, I said to Caesar, I'd say Helen Waltman was fucked up from day one. Fair enough, bro. And I guess we're fucked up now, too. Fucked indeed. There were several roaches already crawling on my legs. You'd think by my line of work that roaches don't bother me, but they still give me the creeps. They're not the same as bugs to me. Bugs are alive. Cockroaches are undead. I stomped one foot, then the other, a strategy that only works in the less insistent buggers. The hangers-on are the hungry ones. Those, my name. Bob, Dave, Charles, Ted. I named them each as I brushed them away. Clearly a neuroses, but we've all got our coping mechanisms, don't we? I've been asked a thousand times, how do you do it, Steve? All the filth. All the death. The roaches the big ones. The ones that sprint up your arms and legs and just stop when they find a good place to stare at you. They sit there, watching. Nothing but their antennae moving. Just waiting. Never turning back around. Every move they make is conspiratorial. Up to your eyes to drink from your tear ducts. Or into your ear canals to cling to your eardrum and nibble the precious wax. I've seen videos of doctors excavating these creatures from the heads of their hosts. Peace by malefic peace, like a crude abortion. So, how do I immerse myself in them without losing my mind? I don't freak out. I don't try squashing each and every one. I name them. I treat them with uncommon respect and expect the same in return. <sighs> You're out of your mind, Caesar said. How many bags you bring? Not enough, bro. Maybe fifteen dozen? Well, let's go get them. We turned to head back out. On the way to the door, my eye caught the corner of a picture frame on the wall, mostly obscured by garbage. A picture frame. The idea of Helen hanging a picture in there was so utterly weird. I just had to see what it was. I lifted the picture out of the mess and took it outside with me. In the daylight, I saw it wasn't a picture at all, but a framed newspaper article. It was almost impossible to read through the stained and mold-riddled glass, but I made out this much. House fire in Orange Oaks claims two. Underneath was a faded picture of a burned-out house surrounded by fire trucks. The smaller print was illegible but the headline gave me the gist of it. What do you got there? Caesar asked. Picture frame. It was hanging on the wall. I'm just curious to see what Mrs. Waltman considered a decoration. Caesar chuckled. <laughs> and what is it? I showed Caesar the framed article. He squinted to make out the moldering print. 
Damn, bro. Who saves articles like this? I shrugged. I've seen people save newspaper clippings, but, you know, they're usually for happy occasions. Fuck yeah, man. You know who saves shit like this? Serial killers. Huh. <laughs> Anything hell in here was a serial killer? Maybe an arsonist, bro. She probably burned the house down. He handed the frame back to me. Maybe you're right. Pretty creepy. This bitch is burning us too, Caesar said, yanking a box of contractor bags out of the back of the truck. A few dozen 60-gallon bags later and we barely made a dent. Old Helen had been quite the collector. Once you dug out the organic rod, everything from old banana peels to decomposing newspapers, you'd start to notice patterns here and there. A box of china dolls and stuffed animals. A set of Christmas ornaments in a labeled cardboard box. There's a kind of subtext to these things that makes me uneasy. Things she wasn't merely compelled not to throw away, but valued as part of something meaningful. In dealing with the dead, meaning was something best to set aside. I learned through the years to try and separate the destruction from the humanity beneath it. Anything that threatens that separation is a threat to my existential comfort. It's best to compartmentalize whenever possible. I've cleaned up a graveyard's worth of remains over my career. Scenes of cataclysmic violence to quiet despair. The bad ones were gross enough to be... Well, gross. But there were others. Too dark to write off like a horror flick or the cover of a Thangoria magazine. The quiet ones. Some had been moldering so long they barely even stank anymore. Just the sour reek of old marrow and the rotten remnants of some failed ecosystem crawling up the walls. Like the ruins of a fallen civilization. They may not be the most repugnant cases, but they're undoubtedly the saddest. Not only did these people die alone, they rotted unnoticed. They'd been forgotten long before they left. You can't get more alone than that. Sometime around when normal people are taking their lunch break, I came across another framed newspaper article. After naming and politely wiping away the roaches, I read the headline. Waltman's service to be held this Wednesday. Underneath, the same picture of the fire scene. I consider just tossing it into the garbage and forgetting about it, but my compartmentalization system was faltering. Besides, I was kind of curious. I took the picture frame out into the daylight and squinted to make out what I could of the article. Survived by their daughter Helen, seven, who... Vista's home for orphans. Services for Mary and Theodore Waltman. Wednesday, April 7th, at Woods Memorial. Well, that explains the first article, I thought. Her parents had died in that fire. That's why it had been so significant to her, being seven at the time. Pretty well disqualified her from being an arsonist. I tossed the frame aside to the back of the truck and turned back to the house. Something occurred to me. Would all of this have happened if none of that had happened? I'd had Helen pegged as doomed from day one. Most of these people, I thought, were doomed to make a mess of themselves. Maybe that was just my compartmentalization speaking. I found Caesar in what was intended as the dining room, certainly the most bioactive room in the house. He was balancing a shovel full of fly-swarmed filth on its way into a drum. Off the side dangled a matted and slimy cat's tail. I expected we'd come across plenty of these. We got cats, Caesar said. So, this lady, I began. Her parents died in that fire when she was seven. She ended up in an orphanage. What? You find more articles? Yeah. Caesar tipped the shovel, dumping the moldering cat corpse into the drum liner. A swarm of enervated flies abandoned ship. Bitch still could have done it, he says. At seven? Who the hell knows, bro? Why are you even telling me? Um, well, I guess I figured you ought to know. Maybe I owe it to Helen, since you've already besmirched her memory and everything. I besmirched her memory? He gestured obviously around the room. 
Bro, I don't even know what besmirched means, but I'm pretty sure she did this shit to herself. Fair enough. Just thought I'd tell you the latest developments. I've always liked a good mystery. Caesar dug in with a shovel and immediately scooped up another cat. Half of another, anyway. It came out bisected at the midsection, leaking entrails and putrefaction. This cat's besmirched, bro. I chuckled. Yeah, I guess it is. Seven dozen bags in and I'd broken through to deeper layers of rot. I encountered some cats of my own, not one among the living, partly eaten some. The slimed and disjointed limbs coming loose with the slightest tug. I seized one by the tail but the skin slid degloved from the bone. The roaches had nested deep in the mass and scrambled to find darker recesses as I uncovered them. Well, most of them did, anyway. The others I named and brushed back into the heap, some with the size of a dime, others with the size of silver dollars. The big ones were the worst. They seemed to have evolved over their underlings, some awful sentience in their twitching antennae. Tom, Dan, Pete, Brian. Underneath I found my first piece of furniture, an ottoman so bug-eaten and soaked with gore the original pattern of the fabric was indiscernible. A few bags later revealed the sofa, a dead cat burial ground. Cats stuffed between cushions, melted into the upholstery. Dozens of them, some reduced to bones and dry pelts, others in various states of decomposition. Finally, I found a wooden chest with a padlock on it. Curious thing. I couldn't help but wonder what, with the rest of the house the way it was, a hoarder of this magnitude would want to keep in a relatively safe place. I shouldn't have cared. Wouldn't have cared, but since I'd seen those framed news stories, I'd become more invested in this mystery than I should have been. I'd failed to follow my own professional advice. And now, I was asking myself the same question Caesar had. How does this even happen, bro? I aimed the blade of the shovel with a hasp at the body of the lock and brought it down. After three strikes, the hasp hung loose. I lifted out the lock and opened the lid. Inside the chest was an old photo album. I took it out and started flipping through the pages. Scenes of a happy family. I recognized a house as the same one pictured in the newspaper clippings. Photos of Helen as a little girl. Her parents, Mary and Theodore. Her father pushing her on a swing set helping her mother prepare food in the kitchen. Polaroid photos with the dates jotted down at the bottom. Somewhere in the middle of the album, the picture stopped abruptly. The last date was March, 1952. A photo of Helen, her lips pursed over the seven candles of her birthday cake. The pages after that were all empty. I closed the photo album and just stood there for a minute. Normally, i just throw it in the bag with the rest of the garbage, but I just couldn't do it. I set the album back in the chest and closed the lid. From the other room, I heard Caesar cursing. This crazy-ass bitch, bro! How does this even happen? By mid-afternoon, it was clear this was going to be a three-day job. Well over a 160-gallon bags of garbage were piled into the dump truck, and it was going to take multiple loads before the demolition team even got near this place. I was still chipping away at the living room, and Caesar in the dining room. Having made a notable dent in the mess, the roaches seemed to be losing confidence. Still, there was a long way to go. Fuck! I heard from the dining room, a little sharper than Caesar's typical refrain. Y'all right in there? Tell me you didn't get caught. No, bro. I just... A crash. Not the typical crash of garbage into a bin, but a louder one. A great shift of garbage like an unstable load in a truck. You all right in there, man? Fuck, bro! Another shift. Another crash. I dropped my shovel and started fighting my way over to the piles of garbage. Caesar! Help, bro! I was nearly there when another crash sent Caesar flying backwards out into the hall. He landed with his back against a closet door, shattering slats of wood. What the hell happened, man? There was a look of horror on his face. He pointed into the dining room. A mass of black garbage 
emerged from the door. Not a collapsing pile like I expected, but a figure. An immense, human figure. But not human at all. A creature. A mass of excrement loaded with decomposing cats, chicken bones, fast food wrappers. A golem of compacted shit. What the fuck? The golem advanced on him. I grabbed for his suit and yanked him out of the hall. We landed with our backs against a heap of trash, scrambled backwards to get over it. We're fucking out of here, bro! The golem roared, filling the room with hot decomposition. We made for the door, but my foot hit something slippery and went out from under me. Caesar and I collided when we went down hard. We scrambled to get up, but the golem bowled a huge arm through the trash pile, spraying garbage, roaches, and rotting organic matter everywhere. Something heavy hit Caesar and he fell back to his knees. Caesar! The golem was on approach. Arms outstretched, it was plowing through the heap, gathering the trash about it like a strengthening wave. Caesar, get up! Another roar and the two of us were bowled over by a wall of filth. I felt the pressure against my chest, felt my feet lifted from the floor. I twisted my face away, spit something foul out of my mouth. Caesar! I didn't see him. He was completely buried. Caesar! The golem was closing again. The trash heap shook with every step. I struggled to free my arms, managed to get one loose, started clawing away trash where I thought Caesar's head might be buried. It was difficult to breathe. The weight of the garbage was crushing. The golem roared again, a freshened wave of heat and stench. It swung an arm, eviscerating the heap of garbage and spilling me out onto the floor. I turned my head and saw Caesar lying prone. It wasn't moving. The golem stood over us. Down its legs of compressed shit runnel drips of the same in foul liquid. A stench that presided over the hoard. It was standing in the stained silhouette where the cops had found Helen Waltman's body. I pushed away on my ass and elbows, a stabbing pain that spoke of a broken collarbone. Roaches crawled over my hands, but this was the least of my problems now. The golem roared. Liquid shit cascaded down its arms and legs. It reached down and grabbed Caesar, lifted him effortlessly into the air and flung him across the room. He hit the wall and rolled onto the dead cat couch, his head hanging at an odd angle. I fought to get to my feet, but a shooting pain in my leg sent me back to the floor. Oh, my knee. God damn it. I pushed away until my back was against a wall of garbage. The front door was blocked. The windows were blocked. The hallway was blocked. Caesar was unconscious, maybe even dead. And here I was with this monster, staring at me with its non-existent eyes, coming toward me with its arms extended, ready to... Helen... The golem slowed its approach. It stopped no more than six feet away. I couldn't believe it. Was this thing really Helen? I wasn't sure if the thought had really occurred to me, or I just named it on a whim the same way I did for the cockroaches. Maybe on instinct I'd done both. I know what happened to you, Helen. I know about the fire, about your parents. It was a terrible thing. The golem didn't move, but there was no other way to read its expression. Talk. Just keep talking. You lost everything, Helen. When you were seven years old, you'd lost everything and you were afraid to lose anything ever again. So you kept everything. I understand, Helen. It wasn't your fault. The golem was still as a statue, shimmering with roaches as it stood listening. Could it really be listening? In the corner of my eye, I saw the overturned chest where I found the photo album. I had an idea. I saw your album, Helen. I didn't throw it away. It's still in the trunk. Do you want me to get it for you? It was the first time the golem moved since I started talking. It turned its head toward the trunk. 
Something in its body language told me, yes, it was okay to go get the album. Painfully, I got to my feet. I limped to the chest and retrieved the album. When I turned back to the golem, to Helen, she had her hands extended. Hands of wet and clammy shit the size of hubcaps, wriggling turds for fingers. I opened the album and placed it in her hand so she could see it. I didn't see any eyes in the face, no features at all. Still, I got the idea she was indeed looking at it. Slowly I backed away. I understand you were afraid of losing things, Helen. But not everything is worth hanging on to. Your memories, the good ones, they're what's worth holding on to. A tense moment as the Helen monster raised her head from the album. Had I said the wrong thing? I knew hoarders could be violently protective of their stuff, were often unreasonable when confronted with their illness. Dealing with these people was far outside my scope of practice, I'm just a glorified garbage man. The last thing I'm certified to do is provide counseling to mentally ill monsters. But just as I was bracing myself for the inevitable attack, the Helen monster appeared to relax. Its non-existent eyes turned back to the photo album. It flipped through the pages, one after another, turning its head left and right to see every photo. And when it reached the last page, the one dated March 1952, I remembered. It stopped turning the pages and just stood there, looking down at it. Almost tenderly, it laid its giant slimy hand on the last page. That's what's important, Helen, I said. All the rest, all this garbage, it's time to let it go. I'm not trying to take away anything important, Helen. I'm just... I'm just trying to clean up the... It slammed the album shut and I braced myself again. There was no attack. Instead, it clutched the album to its chest. It hugged the book, squeezed it tightly against its gory and fecal body, squeezing and pushing until the album was buried in its chest. Until the entire album was inside its body, pushing and smearing over it until the cover was no longer visible. I didn't dare to move. Having subsumed the photo album, the monster turned its attention back to me. But something was different now. I didn't feel threatened. The golem seemed to be smaller now. Looking down, I saw the fetid brown liquid trailing faster down its legs. Faster still. The golem was melting. Liquefying. With an unthinkable stench, the legs puddled sewage onto the floor. Bits of garbage, bones, bottle caps, bent silverware, the carcasses of rotting mice, moldering cat pelts sloughed off, slid to the floor, the turd fingers dropped from the hands, landed in swelling pools of diarrhea. Melted to the thighs, Helen's torso dropped flat on the floor, became flatter still as the septic flash drained into the floorboards. The skull of some small animal a plastic six-pack ring, an old Chinese takeout container, the liquid shit soaking like stain into the pine planks, escaping through shakes and knot holes until the golem was no more than a black silhouette under a pile of half-digested detritus. The golem was gone. Helen was gone. She'd finally let it all go. For a minute or two, I didn't dare to move. Then, I heard a rustling across the room. Bro, what the fuck just happened? I ran to him, forgetting my leg was injured and tweaking it royally in the process. Caesar, you all right? I think so. My head freaking hurts. Where the hell are we? You don't remember? He was suddenly aware of the state of the couch he was lying on and got quickly to his feet. What the fuck, bro? This place is disgusting. Let's fucking get out of here. He wasn't getting any argument from me. 
You'd think, after a day like that, a couple of guys like me and Caesar would rethink our line of work. But, like I explained, people don't really change. At least most people don't. Maybe Helen Waltman changed in the end, but then again, after a little while to process this whole thing, I'm not sure any of it really happened. There was enough noxious gas in that house to kill someone, not to mention trigger a major hallucination. The way I see it, we were lucky to get out of there alive, shit golems or not. Caesar took one hell of a bump that day and still has no recollection of what happened. It probably happened when he fell backwards into the closet door. I thought about telling him what I saw, or what I think I saw anyway, but why bother? He already thinks I'm crazy for naming cockroaches. If I start telling him about shit golems, he'll probably have me institutionalized. At the risk of losing work with the police department, in any case, I declined to go back to the Waltman house. Whatever was going on in that place, it wasn't safe. I'm sure it took some palm greasing, but ultimately the house was bulldozed without a look from the environmental agencies and several million cockroaches were left without a home. I'm driving through a nearby neighborhood one day when the thought occurs to me. I wonder what's going on at the old Waltman house. I've got nothing important to do, so I hang a right on Old Creek Road and head out to Orange Oaks. It might only be my imagination, but when I pull up in front of the bare slab that used to be the Waltman's house, I can still smell a hint of that stench. Sitting there in my truck, the ephemeral memories wash through my mind like a weird dream. It seems impossible that any of it really happened. It seems impossible that such a horror as Helen Waltman's house could have been sitting there on that innocuous-looking concrete slab. I put it in park and walk across the lawn, watching my feet for wandering cockroaches on the way, finding none. I walk up onto the porch and onto the foundation, trying to picture where I initially spotted the stain left by Helen's remains. I walked over to the area, remembering how I saw the monster melt and soak into the floorboards. It's a flat foundation, no basement in this one. So you'd think, with a mess like that, there'd be at least some evidence of what happened only inches above. But there's nothing. Just like I thought. The whole thing was a crazy hallucination. Just as I'm turning to leave, though, something catches my eye. There's an old chest sitting in the lawn, just off the side of the slab. I remember it from the cleanup. It's the chest I found the photo album in. How'd that get left behind? <laughs> Who cares, I tell myself. But, as usual, my curiosity gets the better of me. Without a good reason for doing it, I walked over to the chest and flip open the lid. Inside, I see the photo album. How in the world? I pick up the album and flip through the pages. Those same happy scenes of Helen Waltman's childhood. Swinging with Dad. Cooking with Mom. Pictures of the old house before it burned down. And changed Helen's life forever. And on the last page, the one dated March 1952, a huge black handprint. You've been listening to The Buzzards by author Jeff Sturdevant, as performed by yours truly. Up next, I've got another tale from author Krista Carmen, which will make you glad spring is on the way and that Christmas is behind us. Because it doesn't matter if you know Santa's not real. There are far worse things that visit during the Christmas season, and they can't be bribed with milk and cookies. And trust me, you don't want to be on their naughty list. <laughs> Before I proceed, however, I'd like to tell you a bit more about one of tonight's sponsors, Upstart. As most of us have found out the hard way, getting into debt is easy, getting out is hard, 
especially if your credit score isn't great. Thankfully, now there's Upstart.com, the revolutionary lending platform that knows you're more than just your credit score and offers smarter interest rates to help you pay off high interest credit card debt. With the cost of living continue to creep up, up, up in my neck of the woods, the knowledge that Upstart has my back gives me the peace of mind I need to put all of my energy into recording this show and none of it into stressing about my credit score. Or those student loans that, like the vampires of old, just won't seem to die. Now with Upstart in my corner, I can indulge fully in the good kind of fear and not worry so much about the bad kind, i.e. the kind that comes in the mail. What makes Upstart special is that they go beyond the traditional credit score when assessing your credit worthiness. They actually reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter rate. Upstart believes you're more than just your credit score. They believe in you. They make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate, too. Since they do what's called a soft pull, you won't get dinged during the first step of the process, and it won't affect your credit score to check our rates. And that's great news for those of us that don't need the added hassle. The hard pull, as they call it, only happens if you accept your rate. The best part? Once your upstart loan is approved and accepted, most people get their funds the very next business day. That's right, the next day. No waiting for a week or more to start taking control of your finances. Over 400,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards or meet their financial goals. So, what are you waiting for? Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is top ranked in their category with a 4.9 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash hill to find out how low your upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash hill. Be sure to use that custom URL to let our sponsors know that I sent you. Thanks so much for listening, and for giving Upstart a try this month. Your support means a lot to both of us. Now that I've allowed you to breathe a bit easier and lighten your load, courtesy of our friends at Upstart, allow me to regale you with a tale about something far more frightening than student loans and monthly bills. Holiday horrors with an obsessive interest in keeping things clean and tidy, who will give you something far worse than a lump of coal if you make them angry. Without further ado, from author Krista Carmen, I present to you A Christmas Carol. An eight foot demon with curving horns and hooves the size of dinner plates clomped down Fair Street to thunderous applause. Following in the creature's wake were smaller, goatish imps, their muzzles stretched into lecherous sneers the tips of their teeth tinged red with blood. Annie Pitchler turned to Chow Chin and made devil horns atop her own head, the tips of her crimson fingernails reflecting the nearby streetlights. This is nuts, she shouted over the din. What enlightened city official thought a Krampus parade was a good idea? The bars are going to be full of assholes in goat masks tonight, asking intoxicated women if they've been naughty or nice. Chow pursed her lips and shook her head. Can you stop overanalyzing everything? This is supposed to be fun. At the very least, in no time at all, we can be two of those intoxicated women getting hit on in bars. She laughed and smacked Annie lightly in the shoulder. Annie's expression turned sly. Why wait? She fished a flask from the depths of her purse, which she tipped toward Chow in an understated toast. She took a generous swig, and then another until Chow looked nervously to where two on-duty officers stood, watching the parade. Maybe because there are signs all over declaring this a dry event? Booze is a great cure for paranoia, Annie said, holding the flask out to her friend. She frowned. What's in it? Obstler, Annie said. Chow scrunched up her face. Austrian schnapps, Annie clarified. My grandmother sends me two bottles a year. 
one for Christmas and one for my birthday. It doesn't matter that those two occasions are six days apart. She sends them as reliably as the phases of the moon. Subsequently, each December, the fruity brandy from the old country section of my liquor cabinet undergoes ample restoration. A Krampus costume that took two people to man stomped past. Chow watched with interest, then suppressed a shriek as a demonic elf lunged at her from beside a giant mutilated teddy bear. The elf cackled and skipped gleefully on his way, rubbing his hands and scanning the crowd for his next unsuspecting victim. Chow shuddered and wrapped her arms around her peacoat-clad torso. Okay, so Grandma Pitchler's idea of love is to outfit you with Austrian liquor. Still, it is a Thursday night and you're not normally a pre-gamer. So which is it? Trouble in Paradise or Trouble at the Lilith Center? Annie pulled a cigarette from the pack in the front pocket of her bag and lit it. She took two long drags before answering, the smoke unfurling from her nostrils like steam from a departing train. Things with Lionel are fine. She took another drag. Great even. And the Lilith Center is good. I acquired several new housing locations, and Lionel said our director's pleased with the progress I've made. Chow watched the parade participants go by another moment, then turned to Annie and held out her hand. Give me some of that, she said. Annie raised an eyebrow but handed it to her, amused. Chow took a tentative swig, then a bolder, longer one, her face contorting at the apricot taste, struggling to get the spirit down. A moment later, she handed the flask to Annie, wiping her mouth with the back of her hand. So, you decided getting drunk now was a good idea after all? Annie asked with a smirk. Chow blinked watery eyes. More like every time we talk about your job, I'm overcome by an intense urge to consume the nearest alcoholic beverage. I don't know how you do it. And, no offense, Annie, but I don't know how you do it. You of all people. If someone told me, or any of the Alpha Delta Pi sisters back in college, that you'd end up working for an organization that funnels women out of sex trafficking rings and into safe houses across the country, I don't think any of us would have believed it. Annie gave her a stony look. Shit, Chow. Tell me how you really feel. Their conversation was interrupted by the rising blare of demented Christmas music. A maniacally decorated parade float featuring a white-furred, grinning Krampus paused before their section of the crowd. Krampus's antics were supplemented by an intoxicated Santa Claus, dancing wildly and throwing middle fingers at the reindeer flanking the float below. Chow refocused her attention on Annie. I'm not saying we don't think you're a good person, she continued. I'm just saying, well... I'd have been a hell of a lot less surprised if you'd ended up partner at a big-time firm. You went to one of the best law schools in the country and graduated summa cum laude, for Christ's sake. I just hope you didn't take this job to make Lionel happy. If you guys broke up, would you wake up one morning feeling that your entire career had been derailed? Chow looked like she expected Annie to be further offended by this confession, but Annie merely narrowed her eyes and cocked her head. Of course Lionel has something to do with it. I wouldn't have even known about Lilith Center if we hadn't started dating. But I'm not doing this work because of him. I'm doing it because I'm good at it. I'm good at juggling the moving parts, at getting the victims out of shitty situations and into new, better ones. Of course you're good at it, Chow proclaimed. But you would have been good at anything you tried. Her features softened. As long as you're happy, your friends are happy. Just don't lose sight of your long-term career goals. That's all. A demonic nutcracker weaving its way through the crowd snapped the teeth of its wooden mask shut behind Chow's ear. Chow let out a little scream. Jesus, she said, moving closer to Annie, keen to change the subject. They're really committed to bringing these creepy-ass legends to life. Don't kid yourself, Annie said. They're the same bozos we see each morning on the subway, but ballsier because they're in costume. Chow wasn't convinced. They're figures rooted in centuries-old beliefs. There's a reason they persisted for so long. Without warning, she squealed and grabbed Annie's arm. Jesus Christ, what the hell are those? Annie craned her head, squinting against her mounting drunkenness in the glare of floodlights. When she finally caught a glimpse of the approaching yuletide creatures, a chill ran up her spine. I have no idea, she said tonelessly. They look like... Plague doctors or something. 
with masks like the skeletons of birds. The float inched closer, halting when it drew even with the medical building, the awning of which Annie and Chow stood beneath. There were five of them in total, dressed more or less the same. They wore long flowing skirts and a variety of colors, sweaters and grandmotherly kerchiefs, with strange straw slippers on their feet and mittens covering their hands. The skirts were of the coarsest fabric, and several of them were patched and the kerchiefs wrapped around their heads draped generously down their backs. But it was the masks that drew Annie's eye the most. Far simpler than any they'd seen, long white beaks of hoary linen, featureless, yet harsh. As the creatures moved about the float, the masks opened and closed like gasping fish, and with each closing of those awful beaks, Annie felt the resulting clap in her bones. The creatures carried wicker baskets on their backs. From several of these baskets protruded the mangled limbs of dolls. Three of the creatures held grossly oversized tools in their hands, prompting Annie to want to check the side of her flask for the words, Drink me. The tallest, huddled in the front left corner, wore a violet skirt and dishwater gray sweater. Its slippers were mismatched, one red, one navy, and its kerchief, mustard yellow. It did not menace the crowd with its large, sharp clippers so much as it mined shearing some unseen thing. Annie was reminded of the glinting clippers her mother had used to trim the hedges, a memory she had not recalled in years. The second creature handling a tool wore a patchwork skirt of random patterns. Its sweater was mauve with large white buttons, and its scarf was vibrant red. This creature's scarf was tied further back on its head than the others, making it all the more obvious the creature had no facial features of which to speak. It held in its mittened hands a broom made of twigs and swept invisible debris onto the street. The final creature to wield a weapon, for that's how Annie had begun to think of the trio's tools, wore a floral skirt and an olive green sweater. Its massive wooden scissors slashed at the air like a dangerous bird, and once, the creature turned so quickly a dangling leg from its basket lodged between the scissors' blades. The hollow claps of the masks weren't the only noises the creatures made. At first, Annie thought she was too far away to make out their words, thought them to be singing or chanting some Christmas carol or poem. But when the din of the crowd ebbed, Annie could discern what it was they said. A single syllable, meaningless, at least to her ears. Repetitive. Unnerving. Ga, 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 they intoned, over and over again. Not in any sort of pattern or in unison. There was no method to the chant. The creatures croaked their respective gaws at their own discretion, resulting in an eerie cacophony, an otherworldly chorus. Annie felt the skin beneath her sweater rise in goose flesh at the sound. She tipped the flask to her lips, but was dismayed to find it empty. Hey! She called to Chow, who had somehow moved several feet away from her as they'd watched the bird mask crones. She held the flask upside down and shook it for good measure. What do you say we get out of here? Lionel's probably out already, and I've seen enough of these stupid costumes. Chow looked about to protest, then shrugged. Sure, let's go. They moved quickly through the still-wrapped crowd and headed down Washington Street, the welcoming glow of the bars ahead, like a beacon in the night. Annie had never been to the Bokshorn prior to getting together with Lionel, but since they'd started dating one year ago, it had quickly become their spot. Granted, it was Lionel's spot, with everyone else he knew as well, so Annie was not surprised upon entering to see him surrounded by hangers-on. I'll get us some drinks, Annie said to Chow and the other woman pointed toward the restroom. At the bar, she ordered a glass of schnapps, no sense diverging from what worked, and a dry martini for Chow, then made her way to a table at the other side of the room and waited to catch Lionel's eye. When he saw her after a moment's time, his expression shifted from merriment to fear. A tall blonde man strode up and handed Lionel a shot which he downed without hesitation. Be right back, Steve, he said, pushing the blonde man aside. I've got to say hello to my girl. Annie stood in preparation for his approach, 
and Lionel kissed her on the cheek. Where's Chow? he asked, scanning the bar over Annie's head. She's in the bathroom. We only have a minute. Lionel let her past a bank of pool tables at the back, and Annie tried to walk casually, her gaze on the jukebox ahead. When they'd situated themselves as far back at the dark corner as the room would allow, Lionel leaned down and kissed her hard, first with passion, then rather desperately. Annie allowed the kiss to go on for several moments, then pulled away and blotted her lips. We don't have time for this. Tell me now, Lionel, what did Jonathan say? Lionel's eyebrows furrowed, clouding his handsome face. He uh, still thinks it was some sort of unfortunate mix-up, some miscommunication or wires that were crossed, but he's trying to get the women you sent there returned. And if that happens, we might not be able to cover our tracks. Anger rose like a wave in a tempest, and Annie scowled and gripped Lionel's hands. I don't understand. The new houses are foolproof. The managers know how to document false intakes. If it was the hotel we sent them to that brought attention to the rerouting, it's your crisis to fix, not mine. All right, all right. Calm down, Annie, like I said. For now, Jonathan still thinks it was a mistake. To be honest, I'm a bit more worried about the 200 other women we've rerouted than the two in some hotel in Texas. Annie was about to respond, about to say she was pretty goddamn certain that their past and present indiscretions were equally vital to keep hidden, when she heard Chow calling her name. Over here, Annie called, then dug her nails into the palms of Lionel's hands. It's almost New Year's, she growled. Do whatever you have to do to fix this. Then... She spun to face Chow, straightened the hem of her sweater, and affected a lightheartedness she did not feel. Sorry, she sing-songed. We were just on our way back over. The drinks are on that table there. I got you the usual. Dry martini. But if you want it drier, I'll get you some more olive juice. I'm terrible, Chow cried. Barging in on your reunion. I'm so sorry, Lionel. What a way to say hello. Hello yourself, Chow and you're quite forgiven. He put an arm around each woman as they walked to the table Annie had secured. As was always the case, Lionel's entourage soon flocked to his side. Annie went to work drowning her worries and found that by her fourth glass of schnapps, she was able to relax, even enjoy herself a little. How was the Krampus crawl? One of Lionel's friends asked. Annie thought his name might be Todd. We wanted to go, but Washington Street was already closed, so we decided to get annihilated instead. Annie sipped her drink and smiled a lazy, crooked smile before remembering the clap of the creature's beaks. In her hesitation, Chow slid forward in her seat and enthusiastically addressed the... maybe Todd. He was so creepy, she slurred. So much for it being a Thursday night, Chow was as drunk as she was. The costumes were insane. Chow continued, like nothing I've seen before. Furry Krampuses, maniacs, Santas, abominable snowmen, animal-faced demons, and trolls. The worst were the beaked things, Annie said, before realizing she'd spoken at all. When the collective eye of the group fixed her in its sights, she wished she could take back her words. Or better yet, disappear. I mean, it was stupid, really. Idiot frat boys in costumes. An excuse to get out and about in the dead of December, I guess. The beaked things, a woman Annie had never seen before said. Were they dressed like old women? Featureless, said only, ga? Annie shivered, remembering the giant wooden scissors. Yes, those were them. She observed the woman more closely. Tall boots, jacket trimmed in fur. Long auburn hair and dangling earrings. You were at the parade as well? No, but I know the creatures of which you speak. My grandmother was from Gastein, and when I was a little girl, she'd frightened me and my sister into doing our chores for fear of the... Schnabelpirkten. Schnabel what? Chow said disbelievingly. The Schnabelpirkten, the woman repeated. Offshoots of the witch goddess Perkta. Perkta, like Krampus, makes her rounds on winter nights to reward and punish accordingly. The Perkton, or Schnabelperkton specifically, are a horde of bird-like creatures who enforce Perkta's interests in tidy housekeeping. They move in groups of four or five, chanting their ga-ga-gas. 
Their beaks are inspired by Perkta's prominent nose and are usually made of linen and twigs. Yes, Chow said, her hair falling in front of her face as she nodded. The noises their beaks made gave me the creeps. She paused and pushed her hair back, thinking, What were those packs on their backs? And the giant tools? The woman's eyes moved from Chow to Annie, and Annie couldn't help feeling as if her gaze lingered too long. The Schnabelperkten inspect homes for tidiness, though sometimes make accidental messes themselves. They sweep and clip and trim and tidy, and the packs on their backs are to remind children that, like Krampus, does Schnabelperkten may abduct those who fail in their duties. Worse, however, than the possibility of abduction, the Schnabelperkten are known to employ Perkta's favorite method of punishment. They use scissors to slit open and gut their victims, while the shears and broom remove ropes of intestines from the open cavity. Jesus, Lionel said, sounding more disgusted than engrossed. It's Christmas, not Halloween. Why would anyone pass along such a horrible legend? Why are you sharing this story at all? Then what? Chow asked, morbid curiosity getting the better of her. Lionel shot her a look that went unnoticed. They fill the hole with tow and shavings, straw, dirt, pebbles, and any other assorted garbage they can find. Then, the whole grisly mess is sewn up with a needle made of iron, and the Schnabelperkten move along to their next house. Annie couldn't listen to this drivel another minute. I don't know who the hell you are, she said, concentrating hard on every word. But my grandmother was Austrian too. She never filled her grandchildren's heads with such nonsense. Disembowelment and death because of a dirty house? A little extreme, don't you think? The woman stared as if she could see into Annie's very soul. And Annie forced herself not to squirm. There is more to being dirty than keeping a dirty house, the woman said. Her voice was matter-of-fact, her eyes unblinking. Annie stood and placed a hand on Lionel's shoulder. I'm getting a drink. Chow, Lionel, care to join? She stormed from the table without waiting for a response, but halfway to the bar realized how drunk she really was. Lionel's detailing of their situation, of the fact that the women in Texas might still be viewed as a mistake echoed in her mind. She needed to be on her toes tomorrow, attentive and alert, not going into the office dehydrated and fuzzy-headed. Another schnapps? The bartender asked. Actually, I'd like to square up. As she was paying her tab, Chow appeared by her side. Annie, are you okay? That woman was such a weirdo. She just disappeared after you left. I asked Lionel if he knew who she was, and when we looked up, she was gone. She's as crazy as those bird people chanting God at the parade. Who gets off on scaring innocent people like that? Anyway, Chow, I'm heading out. Tell Lionel for me, okay? Tell Lionel what? Lionel asked, sidling up to Chow. Annie swallowed a sigh. Lionel would try to escort her home, and she wanted to be alone. It's been a long night, she said with as much finality as she could muster. I have a lot to deal with at work tomorrow. To her surprise, Lionel nodded. I understand. Um, text me when you get up in the morning, okay? Annie agreed, kissed him goodbye, and favored Chow with a quick embrace. You sure you don't want to stay a little longer? Chow asked. We can share an Uber home. Annie's phone buzzed in her hand. Can't, she said, and headed for the door. My Uber's already here. The ride to her apartment was cold but quick and she tipped the driver accordingly for skimping on the heat. At the door to her apartment, a swish sounded from somewhere behind her on the street. But when Annie spun around, there was nothing but shadows and the first fat drops of rain. She turned her key in the lock and pushed her way inside, wanting nothing more than to wash her face and slip between the sheets. She changed into sweats and, with a water bottle in each hand, was preparing to make her exit a stone the hall when the muted swish reached her ears again. This time, from the other side of her door, a spike of adrenaline shot through her veins. Is uh, someone there? Annie called. A prolonged swish was her response. Who is it? She choked out. 
her voice quavering in the empty house. Annie took a shaky breath and held it. She was chiding herself for her foolishness and stepping again toward the hall when an answer to her question came from behind the door. Da? Annie's blood turned to ice, then exploded with heat, her righteous anger at Lionel's nerve creating tunnel vision. She flew to the door and pulled it open without checking the sidelight window. As she regarded what stood before her, she'd never hated herself more for her impetuousness. The schnabel perkin from the parade were huddled on her porch, their sharp beaks like pointing fingers. The three with tools were at the forefront of the grouping, and with a single jab of the scissors, forced their way inside. Before Annie could speak, before she could react, before she could think of where she'd left her phone, the Schnabelperken began their feverish inspection, spreading over her home like bats filling a cave. You... You can't be in here, Annie said, not recognizing the shrillness of her voice. If you don't get out of my house right now, I'm calling the police. None of the five paid her any mind, moving methodically, delving into every crook and crack. Food was swept from refrigerator shelves, mail pulled from its slot, bottles of schnapps were tossed to the floor, reduced to shards of glass glinting from liquid amber pools. In what couldn't have been more than a minute, Annie's perfect home was destroyed. The effort employed by the creatures to achieve this result as little as elbowing a dollhouse off its ledge. Annie tried to protest, to demand they stop, to threaten them again with the police. It took a moment to realize her words were being drowned out, that the chorus of gauze had become all-consuming. One of the Schnabelperken must have slipped upstairs unnoticed, for she saw it reappear on the landing. It held in its mittened hands a nondescript folder. Annie's protests turned to ash in her mouth. They formed a circle at the bottom of the stairs, waiting for the more industrious of their group to proceed. When the creature with Annie's folder reached the ground, they turned and approached Annie with the synchronism of dancers. Ga, 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 ga. Their chant fell in time with their slippers. Please, Annie said, tears springing from her eyes. Please, my house was clean. You were the ones that made it dirty. You were the ones that made the mess. The schnabel perked in with the folder was ushered to the front, where it removed a document despite its mittens. It held the typewritten letter up but Annie vehemently shook her head. No, she said. You don't understand. That, that was a joke. A one-time thing. Blindly, she stepped back but collided with the wall, and her tears fell faster still. It wasn't my idea. You don't understand. The whole thing was Lionel's fault. This entreaty, too, was met with only gauze and another page extracted from the folder. This time, the schnabel perkton offered the paper to Annie, indicating it wanted her to read it. She didn't have to. Annie knew what it was. A list of all the non-existent safe houses she'd established. Phony destinations to send the foreign, victimized women she was supposed to help. Women who believed they were being rescued, liberated from months or years of hell. The second page of that document would be a list of businesses, private homes, inns, and hotels, entities that would buy the trafficked women for a price that Annie and Lionel split. It'd been Annie's idea to make a profit off the women rather than sending them on to secure homes. She reasoned that working, regardless of the job being less than minimum wage, or in some cases, nothing but room and board, 
as hotel maids and personal cleaners, was a far cry from drug running and prostitution, and had gotten Lionel to buy into her plan with little more than this rationale. Annie had only used one of her charges to clean her own home on a single occasion, informing the exhausted non-English-speaking woman of her intention via a letter she'd composed using Google Translate. This was the first document the Schnabel Perkton had confronted her with, another file she'd been too careless to erase. Sure, Annie had led the woman to believe it was a job interview of sorts, then sold her to an offshoot of Hyatt Hotels. She'd only discovered months later she'd sent the woman to a separate state than that in which her children resided. But what was done was done. There was nothing Annie could do. Annie felt the night's unending schnapps roiling in her stomach and placed both hands against the wall to steady herself. We already got caught, she pleaded. My boyfriend told me tonight. We're going to be confronted tomorrow. We'll have to own up to it all and I'll be forced to bring the operation to an end. If you leave, I'll clean up everything. The house, the center, my life. I'll make it like it never happened. I'll make everything okay. Ga, 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 ga. The creature has advanced on her several steps. This isn't happening, Annie whispered. Then louder, angrier, accusatorily. You aren't real. Your character is from a children's storybook. Someone sent you into scaring me straight. The schnabel perkton with the scissors moved so swiftly, Annie didn't have time to flinch, let alone move away. The blades met in the middle, slicing through muscle and flesh so smoothly. She felt no pain. As she watched, helpless, the creature with a mustard yellow scarf approached, its clippers aimed at those insides already cascading to the floor. The schnabel perkton with a broom crumbled up the evidence of her misdeeds, fluffing it into worthy stuffing. Her last coherent thought, before darkness pressed on the edges of her vision, was the unfairness of being found with proof of her guilt inside her mangled body. Please, she croaked. She said you'd fill me with sticks and stones. Please take those damning pages with you. The schnabel packed and removed a needle of iron from its pack and carefully prepared the incriminating document with its thread. Annie summoned every last ounce of strength. Please! She should have expected their response. Ga, 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 ga. To Annie... It sounded like God. You've been listening to A Christmas Carol by author Krista Carmen, as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got one more tale for you from author D.D. D. Howard guaranteed to make you question the very nature of reality and your confidence in your own memories. Before I proceed, however, I'd like to tell you a bit more about tonight's second sponsor, Shudder, the premium streaming video service from AMC Networks, with the largest, fastest growing selection of horror, thriller, and supernatural content in the world. They've been super serving members with the best selection in genre entertainment, covering horror, thrillers, and the supernatural for years. Shudder's expanding library of film, TV series, and originals is available on most streaming devices in the US, Canada, the UK, Ireland, and Germany. And you can stream everything they've got to offer, including great thrillers, horror, and suspense for just $5.99 per month. Or save yourself 15 bucks and sign up annually for only $56.99 per year. Shudder has the largest, fastest growing human curated selection of thrilling and dangerous entertainment. 
Think of it as the Netflix for horror. You can count on Shutter.com to keep you guessing with the unexpected. Each and every week, new edge-of-your-seat suspense, spine-tingling thrillers, and shocking horrors are added to their already formidable library. And now, Shudder has exclusive dibs on several of the best horror flicks from the past few years, according to Rotten Tomatoes, including 2017's One Cut of the Dead and 2019's Tigers Are Not Afraid. Oh, and Shudder is uncluttered, too. After signing up, you'll have unlimited access to stream and ad-free on all your favorite devices, including the iPhone and iPad, Apple TV, Android devices, Xbox One, and more. So, no matter what your device of choice may be, there's no need to go without your fix of the frightening. Shudder's got your back. And best of all, Shudder's content is unparalleled in the genre. With their unique collection of exclusive and original films and series, horror classics and blockbuster hits, hits including the Creepshow TV series, Produced by Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. You'll never run out of nightmare fuel. My friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights have been signed up with Shudder for years now, and I just got access myself this past month. And I can't believe what we were missing out on. Collections like classic slashers take me back to the glory days of suspense, and if you're in the mood for some femme fatales, the vengeance is her set will make certain you'll never underestimate a woman's penchant for mayhem again. And of course, there are horror comedies too, so you can enjoy a good laugh at someone else's expense. <laughs> Here at the Horror Hill, we love the classics, so that alone is worth the price of admission for us. Once you add in all the vast selection of new content in their extensive exclusive library, none of which you'll find on Netflix, there's no reason to ever look anywhere else for our horror film fix. The exclusives they have and are always adding are absolutely incredible. Their new exclusive series, The Deadlands, for example, and which is streaming now, features a slain Maori warrior, Waka Nuku Rao, who's sent back to the world of the living to redeem his sins. But... The world Waka returns to is ravaged by a breach between that of the living and of the dead, as the spirits of the newly deceased now stalk the land and hunt its inhabitants. Follow Waka and his companion Mehi as they work to close the rift and restore balance. The series presents elements of action, adventure, and the supernatural and was produced with a special focus on the heritage of the indigenous Maori tribe of New Zealand. Catch new episodes streaming every Thursday. All of this is just the tip of the blood-soaked iceberg. There's so much more lurking inside, just waiting to be discovered. Shudder's always got something amazing to look forward to. Besides the incredible content I've already mentioned, you can check out a ton of other exclusives included with your membership such as Shudder exclusives Beelzebuth and Lizzie, or Mandy starring Nicolas Cage. Or if you're in the mood for something a bit more real, their latest original documentary, Horror Noir, is available to stream right now. If you're anything like me, and I know you are, you won't want to miss any of these films. And you won't have to, once you sign up. So, what are you waiting for? All of this and much, much more is available and at your fear-loving fingertips for just $5.99 a month. And this month, as a listener of our program, you can try Shutter totally free for 30 days and get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Included in your membership is access to Shutter's expertly curated collection, which, once again, includes titles like the acclaimed Tigers Are Not Afraid, one Cut of the Dead, Revenge, and the Creepshow TV series produced by Greg Nicotero and the all-new series The Deadlands, streaming now. Oh, that's right. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use promo code HILL. That's Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com, 
and use promo code HILL, spelled H-I-L-L, to let them know that Jason Hill and the Horror Hill Podcast sent you. Thanks so much for listening and for giving Shudder a try this month. And don't forget, when you support our sponsors, you help support the show. And your support means a lot to me. Now that I've ensured you'll never run low on your supply of nightmare fuel, courtesy of our friends at Shudder, allow me to throw another log on the blazing hearth with a tale that begs the question, just how much can you trust your memory? And would you even notice if things around you changed or people outright disappeared? And if they did and no one believed you, what would you do about it? Without further ado, from author D.D. D. Howard, I present to you The Girl the Universe Forgot. The Mandela Effect. That phrase never meant anything to me. Spooky, I guess, but it wasn't something I thought about for more than five minutes. I mean... Honestly, until college, I didn't even know what it was. I'm not one for conspiracy theories or ghost stories or anything like that. So, what would you expect? I wish I was still so ignorant. It all began in my life science class. I was 20 at the time, and it was pretty close to the end of the fall semester at FSU. My professor, Dr. Arnold had given us our finals early because she had a heart and didn't want us to be studying for everything at once. She figured doing our finals before everybody else's gave us time to study hers without any distraction, and then gave us time to study everybody else's with a little less stress. I loved her for that. But part of me wishes she never had decided to bless us that way. On the last day of class, most people skipped. Everybody knew we weren't really doing anything, and everybody just wanted to be done for the semester. Still, some of us were bound by the attendance policies in our scholarships, and others, just out of courtesy to Dr. Arnold, showed up. I personally was present because I loved her class. One more hour and fifteen minutes of her teaching was a win for me. And hell, I had nothing better to do. She began the class slightly differently than she usually did. We'd often start out with a current event from earlier in the week, something about GMOs, the dramatically declining population of giraffes, or something else relating to life science. But today, we looked at an older article, and something far from relative to biology. It was about the Mandela Effect. I'd never heard of it before. Most of us hadn't. But she was passionate about it. The old lady was usually pretty sprightly while teaching, caloric when somebody disagreed with her, but man, today, she was ecstatic. All right, for those of you considerate enough to show up for my class today, I have a treat for you. I'm going to teach you all about something that you'll probably never forget. Or maybe you'll blow it off, I don't know. But if this intrigues you like it did me, I'm sure you'll be happy you arrived. Can somebody tell me when Nelson Mandela died? Everyone looked around confusedly. Then, a girl raised her hand. He died a couple of years ago? 2012, I think? She slowly nodded, studying the class like she was waiting for something. And she found that something. Seagrave, she pointed to a boy in the class. Why the confused face? Well, um... I thought he died like a while ago. The... 90s or something in prison. She beamed with delight. Well, class, is Amanda right or Cole? Everyone seemed conflicted. Most of us were like me and honestly had no clue. But a couple people agreed with Cole, and one other person agreed with Amanda. Amanda, Dr. Arnold commended, you're closer to correct. He died from a respiratory tract infection on December 5th, 2013. But... Why did some of you think he died in prison in the early 90s then? Several of you thought that. Bodyar, she motioned at one of the guys to explain. Where do you come to that conclusion? I could swear we learned that in seventh grade in my world history class. It was part of Black History Month. Yeah, same here, 
one of the girls nodded. Black History Month when I was a kid. He died and then there was this thing about his wife trying to sue some company? Exemplary. Dr. Arnault was more complacent than I'd ever seen her. You remember all this being said. Except, strangely enough, it never was. None of this was ever said. Look it up. Go to Google and search Nelson Mandela death. You'll find nothing about the 90s or a prison. For that matter, type in Nelson Mandela prison death. You won't find a CNN article or a documentary about his funeral which was televised all over the globe. You won't find his purported cause of death. And you'll find nothing about the riots in South African cities afterward. Because none of it happened. This left me a little weirded out. Most of the class was silent now and waiting for her to make sense of it. It's a phenomenon known as the Mandela Effect, she grinned. A complete mystery. An enigmatic anomaly on Earth with no scientific explanation. And from that point, the hour and fifteen minutes flew by. I thought five minutes had elapsed when it was time to be dismissed. It left me absolutely mind-boggled. Basically, it's this theory that Nelson Mandela did die in prison in the 90s. But then, something happened that somehow reversed this event. And he went on to live decades longer, before dying again in 2013. Though, some of us don't remember Mandela dying in the 20th century, others do. They remember the news coverage, the papers, the heartfelt speech from his widow. But all of it vanished from the universe when this event took place and rewrote history. And all that's left is this huge collective memory. These people that know he died like this and all remember that same thing somehow. But it's wrong. Personally, I don't remember being told Mandela died in the 90s, but a lot of people did. And do. There are two theories behind it. The first and less common is time travel. They say that someone went back in time and altered an event just slightly, but it created a ripple effect that resulted in something changing dramatically. Here's a made-up example. Bob married Sally. Bob and Sally met downtown sometime back in August of 2005. Bob's dog just got ran over and he was grieving. And when he saw Sally walking her dog, he couldn't help but walk over and talk to her. Before long, they were in love and married. Well, then, Jake goes back in time, to the same town around the same time. Jake is driving on the road about the same time Bob's dog got run over. But, since Jake's driving, and he's in front of the car that hit Bob's dog, and since Jake is a better driver, he comes to a halt and never hits it. The dog runs back over to Bob completely fine. So, now... When Bob goes downtown, he doesn't think twice when he sees Sally walking her dog, and they never say a word to each other. They each get married to somebody else, and now their son, who could have cured cancer or something, never exists. But time travel is believed to be entirely fictional and improbable. The more common theory is that there are several universes all alternate, and that sometimes they rub shoulders, or, essentially, cross paths. Like two cars in a really minor accident, a fender bender. Universe A rear ends Universe B, and almost everything is the same except Universe A needs a new bumper. Well, in literal terms, now something between Universe A and Universe B is swapped. Nelson Mandela lived in 2013 and died of a respiratory tract infection and not in prison in the 90s. And now, Everybody in Universe B thought he died from a lung infection instead of in an African jail. This one's the commonly believed one. After Dr. Arnault's class, I looked more into it, and there are other examples too. Take the Berenstein Bears, for example. We all read those books as kids, or at least our parents read them to us. Well, without looking, how was their name spelled? Berenstein? Berenstein. Which one? If you said Baron Stein, you're one of thousands of others that would bet their house you're right. But you're wrong. It was never spelled that way. And what about Curious George? Did he have a tail? What position is the thinker making? 
Is his fist pressed against his head, or is his hand not even balled up, slumped into his cheek, his fingers extending all the way to his chest? Curious George does not have a tail, and the thinker is doing the latter position. These things may seem silly, but if they're wrong, why do so many people believe them to be true? Personally, I have my own theory about the Berenstain Bears and Curious George. When you read the name Berenstain, it looks Jewish or German. And, like many Jewish or German surnames, you think of it ending in Stein instead of Stain. Take, for instance, Goldstein, Pearlstein, <laughs> Hell, Einstein. We all know that name. Berenstain just doesn't look right. And over time, our minds fill in an A with an E. Same with Curious George. He's a monkey, for God's sakes. Of course we think he had a tail. He's even commonly portrayed hanging from a vine, with his head down and his butt up in the air, as if he's hanging from his tail. These are more like the power of suggestion. Through external factors, our memories of these simple things were altered. But then you have the thinker, King Tut's burial mask, and Nelson Mandela, of course. If the thinker really is posing with his hand in a relaxed, non-curled flat motion pressed against his cheek, which is folding over his knuckles, why do we remember his hand completely balled up and resting against his head? And not just us, but popular cartoons depict it this way as well. Why do so many people make this mistake? And King Tut's burial mask? What is on the top of the mask right between his eyes? There's a figure depicted there. An animal, to be more specific. For those of you that thought snake, duh, you're like me. But you're wrong. At least, partly. There's a snake, and a bird. A bird that looks so outlandish and unnatural in that mask that I can't even look at it without shaking my head. There couldn't have been two animals, that looks ridiculous. Look it up on Google and see for yourself. I remember in sixth grade I had a world history textbook with that burial mask on the cover. I looked at that thing every damn day. Hell, when I was nodding in class that's where my eyes fell. Down under the cover of that book, which was sitting on my desk. I never saw that bird. I thought that maybe it could have just been the angle, but the bird sticks out so far that there's no way you can't see it. Unless the mask was turned completely away from you, which it never is. And if it was, you wouldn't be able to see the snake either. I'm not the only one that remembers it looking like this. Popular cartoons draw it wrong all the time, too. But there was always a bird on that thing. Since 1323 BC. Well, enough of my rambling. You might be wondering what all this has to do with me. See... After Dr. Arnold's class that day, I couldn't get this off my mind. I was so spooked out by it, so morbidly intrigued that it just occupied my thoughts. I felt like I was a victim of it. But still, it wasn't some grand epiphany of mine, some life-changing philosophy. After all, I was too busy studying for exams to ponder it that often. But all that changed when I sat down with my friend Asher a week later for breakfast. Asher and I have been friends since first grade. We met at Tawa City Christian Academy in Michigan, in a town with a population of less than 10,000. It was always freezing there, dreary and gray and silent. You could see the whole town from a five-story building. There were miles and miles of abandoned cornfields, and the only real moneymaker in the town was its small harbor at which fishing occurred. I discovered later on that apparently in other countries, Tawa City, Michigan is known as the bird-watching capital of the world. Purportedly, a vast array of bird species migrate there, and it's great for bird-watching. I never noticed that. All I can remember is the snowy gray skies, the silent cornfields, and the feeling that if the place was wiped off the face of the earth, no one would ever notice. Naturally, the public school was puny, but the private school, it hardly existed. In my class, there were 15 of us, 16 including the teacher. So I thought, I'm starving, man, Asher sighed, walking ahead of me into the diner. It was early on a Saturday morning. It was the last week of the semester and we'd been studying like crazy. 
We figured our day would be spent doing the same thing as usual, an amalgamation of studying endlessly and resisting the urge to buy Adderall, which was pretty prominent on the campus around that time. But my day didn't consist of that at all. We sat down at our usual booth, Asher's hair as red and messy as usual. He was a ginger, and a mischievous one at that. He was a prankster, and barely passed his classes. He was here for the booze and the girls, and his grades reflected it. But as best friends do, I forced him to study, and pass. Still, breakfast was a school-free zone. All mention of classes and tests were off-limits at the diner. Here, we wanted to rid our minds of it all. The last time we met up, I went on and on and on about the Mandela effect, to the point he wanted to shove scissors in his ears, so I tried not to mention it today. I'm telling you, man, he sipped his coffee. When this is over, we are partying like crazy. Like crazy, Sean. I don't want to remember where I am when I wake up that morning. I chuckled. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure. Don't you sometimes wish we were back at Tawas Christian? I mean, not back in Tawas City, but just the classes. <laughs> we thought they were so hard. We both laughed. God, we were wrong. Yeah, that was a whole different universe, bro. Shit was so easy compared to now, and there were only 14 of us in total. Unless you include Miss Davis, which is fucking crazy. 14? I think it was 15, man. He looked confused. Nah, bro, 14. Me, you, Aaron Engels, Tyler Mahoney, Zach O'Toole, that quiet girl named Grayson, Elizabeth, Norman, that one kid, um... Hmm. Now, I don't remember his real name, but we called him Taz? We called him Taz because he talked so fast nobody could hear what the fuck he was saying. I chuckled as I remembered him. There was Brian Reed, Amy, the twins, George and Jordan Reynolds, and that one nerdy kid, uh, Dylan, and then Miss Davis. That's 15, including her. And Eve. He squinted his eyes. Who? Eve. The shy girl, remember? Short, blonde, brown eyes, didn't talk to anybody? He shook his head. That was it, man. There were 14 of us. No, dude, I replied. There was Eve. I've been waiting for you to name her the whole time. He just looked at me like I was telling him bread was a liquid. Asher, are you messing with me? Stop, dude. I'm not messing with you. There just wasn't an Eve. I distinctly remember 14 of us. Remember? Four girls, ten guys. No, I shook my head. Five girls, ten guys. That's how it was. Her name was Eve, she didn't talk to anybody, and we both never said anything to her. You're messing with me, and it isn't funny. I started to feel panicked. I've been reading all that shit about the Mandela Effect, and now you're trying to freak me out. Come on! Just... stop it, man. Now he looked frustrated. Stop with that Mandela shit. There's no Eve. You're sleep-deprived. What? I was getting annoyed, but also terrified. All this hysteria I'd embraced lately as I considered that the effect could be real left me feeling hopelessly crazy as Asher argued with me. I knew there was an Eve. She went to Tawas Christian with us. Her face was easy for me to recreate in my mind. Sean, he looked at me intently. Are you fucking with me? No, I replied, trying not to sound panicked. It was such a simple situation, Asher just forgot about her. It was over a decade ago, and she wasn't by any means a notable student. She shied away from conversations, sitting in the back of the room with nothing to say. She only talked when forced to by Miss Davis, and none of us struck up a conversation with her. Bro, you're just forgetting about her. She was quiet, man, like, really quiet. First grade was a long damn time ago. Hmm, maybe, he shrugged. Honestly, though, no. Can't be. Can't be. I remember that class easily. There were 14 of us. You must be thinking about something else. Don't tell me I'm thinking about something else. I felt hopeless. What the hell was that? He glared at me. Man, this isn't funny. You know that Mandela shit's been freaking me out. Please, Asher, stop. I pleaded. He looked horrified. 
Sean, I'm not fucking with you. Why are you getting so worried, bro? Here, he slid me his coffee. Just relax, man. Relax, it's not a big deal. You're fine. She was there with us, Asher. Remember reading group? There were 15 of us. There were five of us in each group. Eve was in my group. No, man. I mean, you're right about there being five in each group, but Miss Davis was in a group. Remember? No. She walked around and supervised, I argued. Asher, Eve was in my group. I know she was because every time she was forced to read, she'd choke up and not say anything. And then the few times she did read, I was always enamored to actually be hearing her voice because I never did like no one did. Asher was still and silent. Both of us knew what we knew, but one of us was wrong. Right? Dude, I begged. I... Her car. Remember that at least? Her mom dressed nicely in a dress always. She'd come to pick Eve up in that fancy black car. I never gave a shit about cars, and I still don't. In my senior year of high school, I thought that Ultima was a car make. I couldn't tell the difference between a Porsche and a Honda, but I remember her car because it was so nice looking. It was probably a Cadillac or something. Come on, man! We used to always think it looked cool when it came into the pickup loop. Her mom was the first to arrive every day, and Eve would get up quickly from her lone corner on the bench and trudge over to the car, and her mom would come out, dress nicely, even if it was snowing, and hug her. Every single time, and she always smelled nice because her mom hugged her every morning too and got her perfume on her. Now Asher actually looked worried. Sean, he shook his head. I don't remember her. I'd say you're thinking of someone else from another school, but we've gone to the same school since first grade, and I don't remember her. Ever. Maybe it was someone you met in preschool. No, 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 we both talked to her. She was in my reading circle in Miss Davis's class. What about after that? You're only talking about first grade. I don't remember her after that. She must have moved, but she was in first grade. That's probably why you forget her. She moved, and you just remember all of us that graduated fifth grade there. No, man. I remember first grade, too. She wasn't there. Miss Davis was my favorite teacher. I remember that year easy. There wasn't a girl named Eve. I don't really know why, but I felt like crying. Imagine that all your life you never believed in ghosts. Then, you see this horror movie or something, and there's a scene where the main character is looking in a mirror, and then his reflection stops following him and does its own thing. And it's horrifying. After that, you just keep thinking about the scene because it scared you so much. But hey, it's just a movie. It's not real. And that's the only thing keeping you from never looking into mirrors again. But then you figure out the movie's based on a true story. Oh, okay. Anybody could say that it's based on a true story, like all horror movies. Just because it could be true doesn't mean it is. Nothing hitting close to home. And then it happens to you. You get out of the shower, you're drying off, and you happen to look into the mirror. You raise your towel to dry off your hair, but when your reflection comes into view, its arms are at its side, and it's staring at you. Holy shit. You're terrified. It's real. It happened to you, and there's no denying it. And that's how I felt at that table. Maybe it wasn't as concrete, but I knew Eve was in that class. I remembered her like the back of my hand. But Asher didn't. Not at all. It was just like the bird on King Tut's burial mask, like the thinker's flimsy hand stretching the skin of his cheek, like the absent footage of Nelson Mandela's huge funeral in the early 90s. I felt like I was going to have a panic attack. For the rest of the day, I didn't study anything. I was too overwhelmed. I tried my hardest to assimilate Eve into a preschool memory, but she was incompatible. She didn't fit. She didn't fit in my neighborhood growing up. She didn't fit anywhere. 
but Miss Davis's first grade class. Finally, that night, I called my mother on the phone. At this point, I wasn't entirely convinced I was witnessing the Mandela effect. Some part of me figured Asher had just smoked too much reefer in high school and forgot about her, and I knew how to find out if I was right. I told my mom that she wouldn't hear much from me this week because of all the studying I'd be doing, which she totally respected, so she was pretty surprised when I called her. Hey, Sean. She sounded excited. What's up? Hey, Mom. Um, I wanted to ask you something. Do you remember a girl named Eve in Miss Davis's class? A short blonde girl with brown eyes? <laughs> That's a random question, she replied. Um, no, it doesn't ring a bell. On your seventh birthday, you invited over all the kids, but I don't remember an Eve. Yeah, I invited her, but she didn't come. I remembered. She was really shy, that's probably why you forgot her. Well, I have some pictures of you in first grade. I could send them to you and you could point her out to me if you see her in them. Why are you asking anyway? Well, Asher doesn't remember her either. It's just weirding me out a little. I chuckled, trying to hide my nervousness. Yeah, it'd be cool if you sent those pictures. Do you have the one of the whole class? The one with all 14 of you? The words left me severely uncomfortable. Um, 15. There were 15 of us, Mom. No, 14, I thought. What the fuck? I whispered. Mom, yeah, just send me the pictures if you can. Oh, okay. Is everything okay, Sean? Just feeling weird. It's, it's weird nobody remembers her. Oh, I don't have the class picture, she sighed. I wish I did. Asher's mom might. See if Asher can get it from her. But I'll send you the ones I have. Okay. Thanks, Mom. We talked a bit longer after that, but my mind wasn't occupied by the conversation. All I could think about was Eve. I could remember her short body. Her perfect posture. The quaint dresses she wore to class, I could remember her scent that to this day still appeared sometimes in supermarkets or in a lecture hall for a fading second just long enough to remind me of first grade. I could remember her voice when she finally worked up the courage to read in our reading circle. I could remember everything about her. I knew I'd be able to point her out if she showed up in any of the pictures. Still, what bothered me was this. The Mandela Effect is a smooth criminal. It's articulate, pinpoint, exact. It leaves no trace behind. Here's what I mean. The thinker, for instance, a lot of people remember taking pictures with it. They know the thinker didn't look the way it does now when they took the pictures, so they go back and find their old vacation album, brushing the dust off and reluctantly finding them posing with their ex-wife before the statue and all the work and awkwardness of thumbing through the old album was for nothing because in the picture, the thinker was doing exactly what they remember it wasn't doing. Even weirder are the pictures that went viral of people standing right in front of the statue posing with their fist against their head. They're in front of the damn thing. Don't you think they'd maybe notice it wasn't doing what they thought it was doing and not pose incorrectly right in front of it? But. Maybe they're not complete idiots, or just downright oblivious. Maybe, when they took that picture there, it was pressing its fist against its skull. And then, when the Mandela effect occurred at some untraceable, inexact moment in time, the picture changed. But only the statue. It left everything else that wasn't the statue the same resulting in the bizarre image of people posing incorrectly right in front of it. I knew that if this was the Mandela effect I was dealing with, there'd be no point at all to receiving these pictures. Whether or not Eve was standing there when the picture was taken 13 years ago, she wouldn't show up in them. The only way to catch the Mandela effect is through relative things, like the people posing wrong in front of the statue. And this wasn't relative. If the universe pulled Eve from existence, then she wouldn't be present in any of the Polaroids. 
but I wanted to check anyway. Maybe something would stand out. My mom sent four pictures. The first was of me, Asher, Brian Reed, Taz, and Norman playing at aftercare one day in the mud. The second wasn't useful either, just me and Asher sitting at a picnic table one night at open house. The third picture, however, was interesting. It was at the Christmas concert. All 15 of us were taught three church songs to sing at the concert, and our parents came and watched. It was humiliating for all of us, except maybe Aaron, who was born to be a star, but it was especially embarrassing for Eve. This photo jogged my memory immediately, and what made it so strange was the formation of the girls. In the picture, you can see all of us on stage. There's a one riser on the stage, and some of us were standing on it, while the others were standing in front of the stage itself. On the left side are the boys, five in front and five on the riser. On the right, the girls, three in front and one on the riser, between two of the girls. It looks like somebody's missing in the picture. You have Aaron on the left, and then Amy next to her, then Elizabeth next to her, and then Grayson is standing on the riser between Aaron and Amy. Eve would fit perfectly between Amy and Elizabeth. Perfectly. Why the hell would they put three girls on the stage and one girl alone on the riser, asymmetrically? Especially when the boys are lined up perfectly. It made no damn sense. And I remember Eve there that night. How scared she was. I remember her white dress and thinking that for once we were all dressed like her. And she didn't stand out. And I remember her crying backstage and being scared to death to go out and not singing the entire time, but just freezing up. I bet my soul that all that happened. The final picture was also useless, just me and Brian Reed in a kickball game that we played in the last day of school. Brian Reed was trying to peg me out, and I'm running like a madman for first base. I saved that picture of the Christmas concert onto my phone. It was just the proof I needed to show Asher. The next day, when I ran into Asher, I showed him the picture. To my surprise, this actually affected him. He seemed nervous when he started to consider how weird the picture looked. He told me that if I mentioned Eve now, after he'd seen the picture, he would have just thought it was a coincidence. But since I mentioned Eve before either of us had seen it, that made it a lot stranger. Still, he wasn't ready to believe in the Mandela effect, not like I was. But he was curious enough to ask his mother if she had our class picture. She did. Both of us waited anxiously for her to send it. I couldn't remember anything about the picture. Still, I wanted to see if there was a strange placement of students like the Christmas concert, and so did Asher. When he got the message, both of us were shaking with anxiousness. The moment I saw it, I gasped. Remember? I jumped. The bee sting! Huh? Asher flinched, startled by my screaming. Asher! I grabbed him. See how we're standing like that? It was because of Eve! Miss Davis stood in the middle of us, seven of us on her left and seven of us on her right. Those on her left were turned slightly to face her. Thus, the left sides of their faces were showing, and the right sides were blocked. And those on her right were turned leftward, so their right was facing the photographer. What stood out was the ample negative space in the picture. When groups pose in this fashion, it's a way to shrink the size of the group. Usually, the cameraman has trouble fitting all the people in the shot, and thus they form this way so they can all scrunch up and fit, but still look natural. But in this picture, it's easy to see that we had more than enough room to stand correctly and still fit. That wasn't the reason we stood that way. Asher! I felt as if I'd struck gold. We're all posed like that because Eve got stung by a bee. Dude, tell me you remember. We were going in to take a picture and she got stung right underneath her right eye. Her face got all swollen and she was crying because she didn't want to look like that in the picture. So the photographer said to pose like this and Eve could turn the left side of her face to the camera. Dude, 
Asher scratched his head. We just posed like this so we could save room. No! We... We didn't. There's no reason to do that. There's so much room on the left and right side. It's unnatural, even. We wouldn't have done it for that reason. I don't remember anything like that happening, man. Honestly. This is starting to weird me out. I think we should just forget about it. I... I can't forget about it, I replied. She was real. I can't believe nobody can remember her. There was only one option left for me to do. I had to have a reunion with them. If we all met up and others of us remembered Eve, I'd know I wasn't crazy. Most of us hadn't spoken in years. Still, I had Aaron as my friend on Facebook. She talked all the time about having a reunion now that we were all in our 20s, and I knew if I mentioned it she would ruthlessly try to put it together. I contacted her that night and she was completely on board. All of us were about to be free from college for winter break, and I suggested we meet back in Tawa City. I was going down there anyway to see my family for Christmas. My mom had long suggested I throw a reunion at the house. She said she'd be honored to host and cater it. When I told Aaron about it, she couldn't be more compliant. She assured me she'd contact the others. All fifteen, she said. My heart raced. I asked, all fifteen? Yeah, she responded. All fifteen, us and Miss Davis. And at that moment, I felt another sense of dread. Aaron always tried to keep the group together. Her forgetting Eve meant something was seriously wrong. When December 18th arrived, I was shocked to pull into my old driveway. I hadn't been there in years. Usually on Christmas, they came down to Tallahassee to visit me. It wasn't anything against them, I just hated Tawa's city. Around Christmas time, it was freezing cold, and most of its residents went south for the winter if they could afford it. It was a ghost town, and a frigid one at that. My parents had picked me up from the airport and driven me here. The entire way I reminisced. As we passed through the frozen over cornfields under the bleak white sky, I felt like I'd been here yesterday. Nothing was different. It was all completely recognizable. Perhaps the only difference was some of the old buildings looked somehow even older. Even more decrepit and abandoned. Throughout the drive, and especially when I got back to my house before anyone else arrived, really, all I could think about was Eve. I felt closer to her here in this ominous forgotten town. Back, entrenched in the snow, something I hadn't felt in years. I sensed that she was in arm's reach of me. I knew that if I were to ever find closure, it'd be at this reunion. If just one other person remembered her... Then I wasn't crazy. Then the Mandela effect was real. And Eve was real. And Asher was wrong. God. I prayed for closure. At four o'clock, all of us that could make it arrived. Miss Davis was unfortunately busy with her family as her father was dying and they didn't know how much time he had left. And Norman was completely untraceable. The last of us to hear from him was Brian Reed, who remembered Norman getting into trouble sometime around 8th grade and going to juvenile detention. After that, he pretty much vanished. Not like Eve, though. He was still in the pictures. They still remembered his name. When the other twelve showed up at the house, I forgot about Eve for just a moment. Seeing Erin again was awesome. She was as beautiful and energetic as always. Her long brown hair now styled maturely, and her vibrant green eyes now only wiser. Tyler Mahoney was also just as handsome as he'd always been. The stud was still dressed to kill, even in the freezing weather. Brian Reed had joined the Navy and was on liberty. He was even bigger now than he was then, and was engaged to his girlfriend since high school. Grayson, on the other hand, was not favored by time. She looked older than she was, remained far shorter than most of us, and her face was covered with acne. Still, she was a lot more outgoing than any of us could remember. Zack looked a lot like how I remembered him. Tan, skinny. The only difference was now he had a mustache. 
He'd worked at Home Depot ever since high school and was still living with his parents that moved to Minnesota. Amy was unrecognizable. She had bright blue hair now, which wasn't necessarily a surprise considering how rebellious she was growing up, but the piercings were unprecedented. Elizabeth was much like she always was, generally quiet and sweet, with her alluring amber eyes that nobody could forget. Dylan didn't look the way any of us thought he would. He was now ravishing, tall, and wore rich stubble along his grand face. He still wore glasses, and I'm glad. Contacts on Dylan would have just been staggering. He had a higher GPA than even Aaron, and all of us were proud of him. George and Jordan both looked a lot different now. George was a construction worker and was wiry and stout. Jordan, on the other hand, was more reserved and amusingly taller than his twin brother George. Jordan's hair was neat and short. George's hair was a thick mess of black curls. They didn't even speak the same anymore. George spoke profanely, and Jordan seemed to be a stranger to vulgarities. It was intriguing to see them so different. Taz was just as goofy as ever. To our surprise, he'd been going to college and was working on a business degree. But when he talked about something he was passionate about, you couldn't understand a word he was saying. The moment he stepped inside, he blabbered on and on and on. And all we could do was laugh. He was just as crazy as ever. Asher and I were generally believed to look the same. Asher's hair was still red, mine still brown. His eyes were still green, mine blue. His face was still freckly, mine smooth. He was still a prankster, and I was still quiet most of the time. The only difference was both of us were more in shape since we started running together. But the complacent joy of seeing all my friends again only distracted me for a short while. Before long, my thoughts were back on Eve. I waited for her to come at the door, but I knew she never would. I waited for somebody to mention her, but I knew it would never happen. With Miss Davis and Norman accounted for, everyone was here. It disheartened me, to say the least. Maybe I was crazy. Maybe I read too much about the Mandela effect and that bee sting thing was just the power of suggestion and that Christmas concert picture was just weird. Maybe I dreamed of Eve once or she was in my preschool and I just screwed it all up in my head. There was no way to be sure. After dinner, we all went into the living room and talked. I tried to enjoy myself, but something just felt different. Eve should have been there. It bothered me so much that no one had asked about her, and I knew I had to bring her up. But I didn't want to look crazy. Asher had asked me not to mention her, and I didn't want to annoy him. I also wasn't prepared to hear them tell me they remembered her. What would I do then? I wouldn't be delusional, but... Then what? The horror of trying to accept what became of her. That would be close to impossible. I wanted so badly to hear from someone that she was real, but I didn't know how I'd ever forget her if I had to really imagine the universe forgetting her. Bumping shoulders with some alternate dimension and ripping her from the snowstorms of Tawa City to some other place light years away, most of it looking the same with the exception of a few things that were just eerily different. I wanted to stay quiet. I wanted to just forget about her. But I knew that wasn't an option. I didn't know what was more disturbing to me. The Mandela effect happening so close to home in my life? Or me being this delusional? Either way, I had to know. I could hold it in no longer. Um, <clears throat> hey guys, I spoke up nervously. I, I need to ask you all a question. Asher looked disappointed. What's up, Sean? Brian Reed asked. Look, this might sound weird, but where's Eve? I was thinking that the whole time. Tyler Mahoney spoke up, and my heart stopped. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't crazy. Somebody else remembered her, and no one else did. There was confused silence devouring the room now. 
Asher looked as if he'd seen a ghost. I myself was horrified and at the same time overwhelmed with relief. Eve? Aaron asked. Eve who? I don't remember her last name, Tyler replied. Oh, quiet, short, blonde chick wore a dress all the time. Holy shit, Asher muttered, bewildered. Holy shit. Am I missing something? Amy asked. There was a girl named Eve in our first grade class, I spoke up. But nobody remembers her, at least I thought nobody did. <laughs> I chuckled nervously. But Tyler, you do? Man, I thought I lost my fucking mind. She's not in any of the pictures. Not a damn one. There's no sign of her ever existing except for my memories, and I swear to God, I thought I'd gone off the deep end, but Tyler, you remember her too. That brings me so much closure. There was no Eve, Dylan responded. I don't recall an Eve. I remember each of you distinctly. I can't imagine how I would have forgotten one of you completely, and yet vividly remembered the rest of you. I agree, Jordan chimed in. There were four girls. I remember that easily. There wasn't a fifth. Yeah, there was, Tyler replied, which gave me so much peace. I had a crush on her, remember? Not to sound like a douchebag, but all you girls liked me. He faced them, and none could deny it. But then I had a crush on Eve, and... The note! I burst out into uproarious laughter, recalling it instantly. Yeah! Tyler laughed. The room was portentously silent. I liked Eve, Tyler chuckled. Nobody knew why I liked her, because she was, you know, all silent and standoffish, but I just fell for her. So I wrote her this super corny, embarrassing note, and I went to hand it to her. And you got caught, I finished, just wanting to see it all line up again. And Miss Davis confiscated it. And everybody wanted to know what it said, because when she read it, she started laughing her head off. And it was the most embarrassing day of my life, he grinned. You guys don't remember? Most of them looked uncomfortable. I... I don't remember an Eve. Elizabeth spoke with certainty. Never do I remember that name. I don't remember the day you're talking about. And we all certainly did used to snicker about you. She smiled but looked troubled. All of us girls. I think we'd remember that. It happened, Tyler shrugged. How would Sean and I remember the same thing? Exactly the same thing, and it not really happen. And how would everyone remember the thinker's fingers balled at a confident fist when they were in fact flaccidly poking his chest? And how would everyone remember King Tutankhamun's burial mask with its lone snake as its crowning feature when all along there was a lucid, brightly constructed bird immediately beside it and how would everyone remember Nelson Mandela's untimely fate in a downtrodden South African prison, resulting in monstrous civil unrest, vividly recorded footage of his ubiquitously aired funeral, and the tear-jerking lamentation delivered by his widow in his passing, when all of it never fucking happened? It's because something disturbing and unthinkable occurred. Something that none of us will ever explain happened emasculating the thinker's resolute stoicism to a pose of deep uncertainty, producing the unnatural bird like a blackhead on King Tut's burial mask, and turning Nelson Mandela into a zombie who lived unnoticed until he passed away again in 2013, leaving those of us remembering differently absolutely baffled. Well, that's just really weird. Aaron's words were the catharsis the room looked for, no matter what Eve's existence or lack thereof meant, none could disagree that it was, in fact, just really weird. We changed the subject afterward, and most of us seemed to move on rather quickly from the enigma. But I didn't. It bothered me the entire time, gnawing at me. I wanted to sit and talk with Tyler about Eve all night. I wanted to hear all the stories about her that he remembered. I was dying to ask him if he recollected the bee sting story. But it just never came up. I couldn't ask it. I didn't want to visit it anymore. It did something to me that I can't explain to imagine that little girl being stung in the eye. 
crying before picture day in our snowy, empty town. The memory alone was enough to make me tremble. The poor little girl, showing the left side of her chubby face to the camera. Where was she now? Why couldn't anyone remember? I did my best to... just... forget. But Eve was stuck in my head. I know I'd never forget about her. The Mandela effect was real. She really did exist once, and now she didn't. What the hell happened to her then, I mean? Really? Oh, it was just too terrifying to think about. And I couldn't forget it. No matter how desperately I tried. Asher seemed to be in my boat. Most of them stayed the night at my house since there wasn't a motel in the entire town and the majority of our parents had moved. The next day, everyone was out of town except me, having flown out back to the land of the living. Only I stayed behind in the snow-scarred wasteland of Tawas City, Michigan. Only I remained in this hot spot of the universe. This place where two realities collided. I didn't receive the closure I'd wanted from the reunion. We all exchanged numbers and were staying in touch now, which was great, but more than anything, I was constantly bombarded by thoughts of Eve. I just wanted something to make sense. I stayed awake late at night thinking about her voice that I could so simply recall. Reading to us, there is a bird on your head, and Max's words. I remembered her so scared at social events, and huddling through the snow, still wearing a dress, though adorned with mittens and a scarf toward her loving mother, where they'd hug outside her fancy black car. I remembered Eve's crying when the bee stung her eye. That memory, for some reason, bothered me more than the others. It just... It just affected me. Something about it really cut deep. She was so innocent. And I felt so bad for her. And now... She wasn't the victim of a simple bee sting. But of some horrible cosmic event. Leaving her non-existent. My parents wanted me to stick around until Christmas, but the thought of that killed me. I didn't want to stay in this wasteland for a week. I hated it. And now, I was scared to death here. Would I get ripped from my reality into the cosmos? It happened here once already. This mystery just consumed the town to me, drenching it and leaving me constantly reminded of Eve, the girl that stopped existing. Days passed and all I did was sit in the living room and watch TV. I enjoyed seeing my parents when they were around, but both worked, and this meant I spent a lot of time alone at the house, which I abhorred. Eventually, I dug through my old closet to find something that might be from first grade. I didn't find anything. I did, however, hold in my hands the picture that Eve was yanked from. The one where she should be between Elizabeth and Amy. But she isn't. She's not there. And there's just that unnatural space in between. Bastard universe. It's so smug. So omnipotent. That it can leave clues as gaping as this. And yet still, there's just no way to prove she's real. But then, on Christmas Eve, it happened. I got a text from Tyler. Sean, I read up on the Mandela effect. That shit's got me fucked up. I think that is what happened. But I remember something now, and this might really prove Eve existed for sure. The note I wrote her. You stole it. You took it off Miss Davis's desk and gave it back to me, but then I told you to keep it and throw it away. You told me later on that you never threw it away, but took it home and showed your parents and laughed your ass off every time you read it. Where is it? If you still have it, it'll be proof. Holy shit. 
I gasped when I read the text. Holy shit, you're completely right, Tyler. I'm going to find that note. I swear to God I will, and when I do, I'll send you pictures. Then, we can prove she's real for sure. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Wouldn't the note not exist now, too? Well, no. See, when the Mandela Effect occurs, only things directly relating to what was changed are altered. That's why the people posing in front of the thinker are still posing wrong. That's why the cartoons in which King Tut's mask has one snake on it and no bird still look like that. The only thing changed is the real deal. So, the actual pictures of Eve, they're gone. She's been pulled from them, and there's not a trace of her remaining. But the note, if I find it, would be just the proof I needed. It would mention her by name. My dad told me that I could feel free to check the storage unit for the note. Apparently, there he'd placed a lot of crap I didn't clean in my closet growing up. And if it was anywhere, it'd be there. I even faintly remembered stealing it now like the rotten kid I was and reading it from time to time for a good laugh. Some part of me wanted to wait until my dad got off work to check the storage unit with him. But I knew, somehow, that I'd never find the note if he was there. I felt like I had to do it alone. I drove there through the snow on a day just as bleak and silent as any other in Tawas. I passed the lonely cornfields, the ominous tower-like silos, the seemingly empty fish shops, and the frozen harbor. It was all just how it always was. When I got to the storage unit, I was strangely horrified. I felt like I was about to walk into a haunted house. As a kid, the storage unit always scared me. In all my life, I know as a fact I have never seen another soul with other. It was always dark and empty. And now, without him by my side, searching for this letter about a ghost, I was mortified. But I continued on. I entered the frigid, voluminous metal halls, journeying through them and turning on the lights as I stepped into each corridor. Finally, I arrived in our unit. I dreaded lifting the door. It made a frighteningly loud creak. It unsettled me to hear it, even though I was the one making the noise. I lifted the door as quietly as possible, which wasn't quiet at all, then began my hunt. I looked for over an hour. I could barely reach the boxes in the back, and each one was filled to the brim with junk usually sporting a silverfish or two. But then, I found it. My baseball cards. These were from first grade. They were in a plastic container barely visible under the pile of junk in which it resided, but I grabbed the box, sliding it out of its tomb and into my arms. I opened the container. Inside were the baseball cards, a barren stain bear's book, fucking creepy and spelled with an A, of course. Some doodles and old notebooks, and a folded up letter. I recognized it instantly. I held it in my hands. Now, in the lonely, cold, silent, eerie storage unit, I caressed the piece of evidence the universe forgot. I slid open the old paper, hardly able to breathe as I searched for the name I unfolded it. Dear Eve. That was all I had to read. Dear Eve. Dear Eve. Dear Eve. I folded it up. I slid it in my pocket. I took a long, deep breath, leaning against a pile of dusty boxes. Eve was real. The girl that stopped existing was really here once in this graveyard of a town, and I wasn't crazy. And somehow, some way, Two universes collided, and Eve was ripped into oblivion by the silver fingers of the cosmos, vacuumed from existence without a single trace. Except my memories. Tyler's memories. And the note in my hand. What happened to her? Where was she now? Was she alive? Where was that sweet, quiet, sobbing girl? And would I ever know? Probably not. 
She's in a place where Curious George has a tale, and where children grew up reading the Baron Stein Bears. She was taught that Nelson Mandela died in a South African prison, and when she pretends to be the thinker, she isn't posing wrong. I hope. Or maybe she's nothing now. Maybe the universe made a tragic mistake, and that harmless girl will never trudge into her mother's loving arms again, but instead spend eternity scared to death, trapped in the swirling gray snow. I have no idea. But as I sat there, all I could do was imagine the ghost of her sitting there with me. I felt so close to her in that place that time forgot, in that meaningless metal room, trapped in a town in which the universe made a mistake. When I finally flew back to Tallahassee, I couldn't be more relieved. I vowed that I would never return to Tawa City, Michigan, no matter what the reason. As far as I was concerned, it was better left behind like Eve was. But like usual, I just couldn't escape her. I texted pictures of the notes to Asher and Tyler. Both were equally as messed up. We all just tried to put it behind us, though. And then, Miss Davis updated her Facebook. I'm sorry I couldn't make the reunion, she posted. But I just want to say that I'll make the next one for sure. To my favorite class ever. She also published a picture, a drawing from Elizabeth. It was a drawing of the class. It was clearly drawn by a child, amateurish, simple, messy in color pencil. But simple as it was, there was nothing normal about it. It was a drawing of ten little boys, and a drawing of five little girls. A drawing of a short blonde girl with brown eyes in what could only be distinguished as a dress. I don't know how anybody else reacted to that, but I know I'll never unsee that image. Even now, all these years later, sometimes she comes to mind. I can't help it. I've seen horrible and unexplainable things in my life. Two towers destroyed by hijacked planes for no reason at all other than sheer hatred, leaving thousands dead. A free school invaded by an active shooter that employed military tactics, killing little children, and entirely unprovoked by anything. But none of it, none of it affects me more than Eve, the girl the universe forgot. You've been listening to The Girl the Universe Forgot by author D.D. Howard, as performed by yours truly. As it turns out, listener, a hand-drawn picture may just be worth far more than a thousand words. In fact... If the Mandela Effect is any indication, those types of drawings may be all we have left to remember some things by. Such as in the case of that little girl named... Uh, hmm. Well, that's odd. Oh, I can't remember her name. Wait. What was I just talking about? Hmm. Oh, well. Probably wasn't important. <laughs> I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week, when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumb from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Tonight's episode featured tales from the very talented Jeff Sturdivant, Krista Carmen, and Dee Dee Howard. The Buzzards was written by and presented courtesy of Jeff Sturdivant. Jeff is an ABR award-winning author of the book Occupational Hazards, The Blue Collar Omnibus, 
and several other books available on Amazon and Audible.com. He lives with his wife and two daughters in Palmer, Pennsylvania. To find Jeff Sturdivant's audiobooks, visit him at flexfiction.com. That's flex, F-L-E-X, fiction.com. He also welcomes you to connect with him on Facebook as Jeff Sturdivant, or on Twitter as at flexfiction. A Christmas Carol was written by and presented courtesy of Krista Carmen. Krista lives in Westerly, Rhode Island, with her husband and a beagle who rivals her in stubbornness. Her work has been featured in a myriad of anthologies, e-zines, and podcasts including Unnerving Magazine, Fireside Fiction, Year's Best Hardcore Horror Volume 2, Tales to Terrify, Third Flatiron Strange Beasties, and Albin Lake's Only the Lonely. Visit KristaCarmen.com for more details today. The Girl the Universe Forgot was written by and presented courtesy of Dee Dee Howard, a repeat contributor to the creepypasta horror fiction community, currently residing in Florida. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them and free, and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Finally, thanks again to today's sponsors, Upstart and Shudder, for their support of this show. As a reminder, you can see why Upstart is top-ranked in their category with a 4.9 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot. Then hurry to upstart.com slash hill to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash hill. And don't forget, to try Shutter free for 30 days, go to shutter.com and use promo code hill. That's shutter, S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com, and use promo code hill, spelled H-I-L-L, to let them know that Jason Hill and the Horror Hill podcast sent you. Thanks so much for listening and for giving Shudder a try this month. And don't forget, when you support our sponsors, you help support the show. And that means a lot to me. Thank you for your support. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night, sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, If you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. (laughs) The darkness may have found you, (laughs) but it's up to you to let it in. (laughs) Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. And a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. 
Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 